Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sidelined, the podcast to get your fix while sports are in limbo. Here are your hosts, Abby Labar, Carlin Baith, and yours truly, John Root. We are back with another episode of Sidelined. Guys, thank you so much for the support that we've gotten over the last few weeks. We've had some unbelievable guests. We've been really lucky to really share the ins and the outs of this business and kind of what everyone's been doing as they've been sidelined. And this week, nothing shy of amazing when it comes to our next guest. If you've watched sports over the last 10 years or so, you've probably seen her. She's done everything from sideline to hosting her own shows, MLS, Fox Sports, ESPN, all that jazz. And now she has not one, but two of her very very own shows on Fubo TV, Drinks with Binks, and then Call It a Night. That's right. It's Julie Stewart Binks. She's truly phenomenal and the epitome of just somebody who's really paving her own way in this industry. So it's it's amazing to see what she's doing. She's hilarious. Um, she's been doing some stand-up comedy and, and has incorporated that into her show. So if you haven't seen her, you have to go watch her for sure. Julie is someone that I've known for a long time, you guys, and she's just a real joy to watch and see how she incorporates her real personality into the different things that she's able to kind of inject herself in, in the sports world. And Abby, you kind of mentioned it a little bit of stand up comedy. She talked to us about how she took improv classes and kind of infused that into what she does for work. And um, there's a line that she's going to mention in here. And, and I love it so much. It's about what to do when you're offered your own show and even talks about her manager and how he was able to kind of push her into this platform. And I'm just so proud of her as a friend and just to see how far she's come over these past 10 years. She's just a real, a real inspiration. And, and I loved hearing kind of her story and the, the nitty gritty about the behind the scenes of what makes Julie, Julie. Well, I've never met her before, so I know I'm super <laughs> excited about that. But we're going to talk about so much greatness between being serious, but still being funny and finding the happy medium between that. But let's go meet her. Let's do it. Let's get the party started. Ready. Come on. Okay, I just would like to start uh, by saying that I was able to get revenge on Pete Blackburn for you yesterday. Awesome. So Thank you. He, I know that was like... Uh, really frustrating he did not deserve to win so I um I whooped his butt for sure so thank you well I mean if I couldn't do it I am happy that another woman could so thank you Abby <laughs> he was totally embarrassed well thanks for joining our podcast um we appreciate you taking the time out for starters what the heck have you been up to since sports have been in limbo because we're all trying to find creative ways to keep ourselves entertained during this time yeah, well, guys, thanks so much for having me on and thinking of me during this time. Um, I've actually been really busy right now because the show that I host, Drinks with Binks, on Fubo Sports Network has still been going on. And luckily, like it transfers oddly really well during quarantine. So kind of like this, we can set up over virtual program we use called Riverside. And then we can actually connect with more guests than we had before just because of the ease of doing stuff online before, you know, we're, we have guests coming into the city. We kind of try to time it out with any kind of PR that they're doing. And it's a, it's a huge production. So we're actually, you know, saving money during this time, being able to kind of do stuff like this. Obviously it's different because you're not able to interview people in person. It's completely different with body cues and timing and all that kind of stuff. But luckily we've been able to get creative. I just on my own started doing, so my, my show is like, I interview athletes, broadcasters, celebrities, kind of like everyone. We have fun. It's, it's just sort of, it's drinks and their life. And then now I've been kind of expanding in my own time, just, okay, let's make drinks. So I was talking with one of my friends who's like a mixologist in LA. We did a little fun espresso martini thing, and I'm going to do something fun for Cinco de Mayo and kind of just starting to, you know, we have limited resources right now. It's like thinking, well, what can I do right now that can at least still keep my skills sharp? still if work allows you to work during this time and then think about ways to I mean just keep yourselves interested and in learning and growing during this time so that it's kind of not just like summer camp or or like being at your parents house where then okay time's up two months later I guess it's time to go back to school no we got to keep we got to keep moving and growing during this time but 
to a limited amount. Like I don't want people, I'm not trying to tell people to go overboard because that's also a lot of mental stress too. Like we're all still trying to do our job, but not like go overproductive because that's not what we're doing right now. You know, we're staying inside to stay safe. So it's sort of just that balance. How do you balance that kind of like content fatigue? Because you listed all those amazing things. And then on top of that, you also have the other side podcast with um Jackie Redmond and and LG and that's like just like a fun thing you guys seem to be doing in your free time but like how do you kind of balance all of that and not get exhausted (laughs) yeah I think it's just trying to figure out like what do I need this for like for my first of all work comes first obviously so for my tv show how many do I need to do a week how many can I do a week let's not go overboard just to work because I think right now people are thinking oh I need to stay busy I need to show my bosses like I'm valuable or worthwhile and I need to also show potential employers and networks out there that like look what I've been doing and first of all they don't really care what you're doing sure it might be fun if they see something pop across their timeline and like oh wow that's great but like they're also worried about their jobs their employees all these other different things so I think like what I figured out is trying to think like okay maybe one one time a day if I want to do something like I'm going to work on this show today maybe I'll work on something else tomorrow almost like one project a day which is a lot sometimes it's like two to three a week but then thinking like for the Jackie um Lauren show that we do called what like that's so easy and fun and the hardest part is we're trying to make it short we want to make it just 10 minutes but we end up just like gabbing for 40 minutes before we even start because it's fun (laughs) right you're like just getting to shoot the shit with your friends so I think it is important to remember, like, just focus on your priorities. Like what? Okay. So don't spread yourself too thin. And, you know, even think about this ahead of time. It was like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. It's like, no, no, no. Just don't try to do too much. Think of like two or three things that you really want to focus on. And the rest of the time, maybe learn other things. Like you don't, not all your time has to be spent on work and like trying to do things toward work. Like try to, I'm now trying to think like, what books do I want to read? What documentaries do I want to watch? And even just like things I want to learn because yeah. we have this odd time where we can sort of like take a step back and take a pause and think like, okay, what are the things that I needed to know before about life, about history, about the world that I didn't? And I can kind of like think about learning that now. So that's what I'm now, that's like my next step after these 53 days I've been inside thinking like, okay, work, check mark, check mark. Don't do so many other work things. Think about other things you can do as well. Quarantine school with JS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're all just getting inundated with content all the time. And I'm sure as a content creator, you're thinking like constantly, like I need to come up with something unique. I need to come up with something that someone else hasn't done. I need to get a, a guest that might not have gone on another show. So are you finding ways to just like really relax? Cause you're trying to find out things to better yourself, but have you been, actually been able to relax? I think now that we're a little over a month in quarantine. Yeah. I think like I've, I have more ideas than I've been able to execute. And I think like that also comes from, Oh, having to do your hair and makeup and like set up the lighting stuff and like what supplies do I need and how can I do all that kind of stuff? And I have ideas almost like, I'm trying, I'm thinking we're going to be in this for a really long time. At least I think for my show, I can't imagine having guests in, in a studio. Like I can't imagine people traveling and then also coming into a place. So I think I could be doing this conceivably for the next six months. Let's just say, um, let's go big on that. So I started thinking, okay, well, I really like writing topical jokes and doing stand up. I haven't done that in a really long time. Be fun to maybe come up with some sort of, almost like John Oliver type of like two to three minutes sort of stand up topical jokes that I could then edit and put out on social media. And that'd be fun. Okay. Well, it's going to take a bit of time to write it and do all this. And then it's like, you're creating your own deadlines and projects. So, which is good. But then also like, I sometimes put way too much pressure on myself where I had come up with some idea the other day and then I have it on my to-do list. Like, okay, I have to do that. I have to do that. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, that was just an idea you came up with for fun. You don't have to be in the spotlight 
all the time doing this kind of stuff. Also, it looks like pretty desperate too to people. Like it looks like you need that a constant attention. You need that constant um, verification and validification that you are someone that is interesting and cool and liked. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's okay to just like take a step back and just pick your battles in a way. So I do relax and I have been relaxing. Just like Carlin, it was my birthday on Thursday. Happy birthday. We birthday are twins. Birthday twins. <laughs> yes. And yeah. so took a couple of days off too to just uh, to just do that. But it's like, oh, if you find yourself, I had like this this ridiculous outfit I rented from Rent the Runway. And I'm like, okay, well, I have this. Like I should take a picture of myself in this. Like no one will ever see it. So then I make my boyfriend take a photo of me, do a whole stage Instagram thing. And it's like, well, those things can still exist right now. It's just like, figuring out how much energy you want to put into all that other kind of stuff. So you, you talked about like, Oh, like don't want to seem like, Oh, all the attention's on me, like whatever, when it comes to trying to keep yourself and your presence out there, but you do such a good job at like being yourself and being unapologetically like you on social media and on your shows. What, you know, you've had a really long successful career and at what point did you get, to be so confident and comfortable in your own skin where you could be that way without having to think twice about it? I think it was, uh, it's still definitely, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words, but um, I think it's um, still like one of those juxtapositions. You try to figure out like one of those lines all the time, like, hmm, is that where I want to go with that? Or is that too far? Or is that not far enough? But I think it was, I had some time in between jobs, like about two years ago after I worked at Barstool and I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do next. And I sort of just started doing things I liked while I tried to figure out like, Hmm, I don't necessarily want to do sideline reporting. I don't really know what I want to do. And I did a lot of uh, improv, which I first started to like get better at listening and responding in interviews. And then that morphed into just like me really enjoying the performance aspect, making friends and just having fun, like goofing around. So then that morphed into doing stand up because I would do Instagram stories and they're silly. You know, it's like the stupidest, it's like Seinfeld. It's like a show about nothing. Like my Instagram <laughs> stories are about literally nothing or about Your epic this, like, battle with West Elm. <laughs> yeah. Like these weird rivalries that begin or like I had a mouse that I named Sandra Kevin because yes! I didn't know if it was over oh my gosh. I remember Sandra Kevin. Yeah. They just like, they become such a staple in my daily life on these Instagram stories or like just the thing that you make consistent and people don't get start to get to know it's like oh yeah the construction oh yeah your battle with this furniture company and people really like them like when I at least when I wasn't working it was like oh I like this and I started at that time I was trying to look for signs as to where is the energy telling you that? Where are the doors opening? And everyone kept being like, oh, I love this. Oh, you're funny. Like, I like the way you tell these stories, yada, yada, yada. And so then I started doing stand up for that. And so there are times when I think during this time, like, I hadn't been doing Instagram stories as much before. But during this time, I just started like, hey, this is me. I feel comfortable doing this. Like, it's almost like a bit, but I also. I get positive feedback on it, so then I feel okay doing it. If I was to get like, hey, maybe tone it down a bit or don't do that, then that would negate sort of like the content I put up. But for the most part, people enjoy it. It's kind of stupid. It doesn't mean anything. It's it's just what everyone else is kind of going through too. So I've just sort of felt comfortable with my voice in that way. And I think that's just like during that time, I figured out what I liked, what I didn't like. I'm still obviously trying to figure that out every single day but once you sort of think about like what your identity is and it's not just like oh it's I work at this network oh I cover the sport it's like no no I'm so many more things than that and I think once we all figure out that we are more than the network we work for the paycheck that comes to us that's when you start to feel really comfortable and just like no this is Julie Stewart Pinks this isn't like this person that worked for this network so um, yeah, I just, I feel good about that stuff. There are a lot of stories I do not post or I'm like, yeah, that's kind of silly or stupid and like, don't put it up. So there's still like that boundary in my head too. Hey, that's such a good point that you make about the social media, because that's a question that like 
I've gotten asked multiple times in interviews and stuff like, what's your social media like? Like that's what this day and age is with our industry. And a lot of times it's like, you know, people create these TV like profile pages, especially like one of my friends works in local TV and she has to have just a separate Instagram account for her TV. But like our audience wants to connect with you, the person. Like, so I think it's important to still have that you yourself that identity on your social media because that's what people want to like they want to be able to connect with you you don't want to put on this persona that you're like just tv julie or like tv abby whatever so that's such a that's such a cool point that you make with that yeah i know and and, and it's uh you know people as even if you have like a super high profile job or you're like an nfl sideline reporter and people want to see that news and the insight that you have but they also they're following you because they probably like you maybe as a person or they like you as you're reporting and so when you do have those you know we all sitting around watching the last dance and you kind of have just those basic takes that ev not basic takes but like funny takes that everyone sitting in their living room would have and it humanizes the people that we sometimes hold in like on a pedestal in such high regard it's like oh they're just they're just a regular person and they have this job but hey they're funny or they're weird or they're different so it's you know it's just it's just being relatable not trying to be relatable it's just like being yourself before we go back to like the beginning, beginning, how were you able to kind of utilize the improv that you were doing and the stand up that you were doing in your time off after Barstool to get these two new shows that you have right now with Call of the Night, Drinks with Banks? Because you, like Abby was saying, you're just like unapologetically yourself and you're able to display that. You're able to have these guests and have these shows and it's incredible. How did you kind of like, finally use like you're like hey I'm JSB take it or leave it how did you kind of use that with the network and like kind of acquire those jobs I don't even think I've talked to you about this about like how that happened I just saw it one day on social media and I was like oh my yeah. god she's got her own shows of course. <laughs> incredible yeah well it, thank you yeah it's interesting I think it's like once I know you kind of see these things all over Instagram or Twitter all this but it's like once you kind of dial in and figure out what you want and then you kind of start leaning into that vein of, I was like, oh, I kind of want to do more than reporting. I want to do stuff that's personality driven. I want to have my own show. And this is what I like. I, I would, I really started to lean more into like late night hosts, late night comedy and all that kind of stuff and, and learning how to write like that. And so because I was pivoting myself in that way, positioning myself in that way, those are the opportunities and like, I'd say the colors I started to see that I hadn't seen before. And then I was approached by Fubo in March of last year about they wanted to create some shows and it was kind of a very loose idea, but I was still had some other jobs at CBS and SN1 and was like, okay, you know, we'll keep this conversation going or whatnot. And then started to gain steam in that, like, we want to give you your own sports comedy show or like, we kind of started, it was almost like we were dating. It's like, what do you see in a show? What do we see in a show? And I was like, I want to do something that's like a bit different, a bit more fun. And I like the idea, obviously, of like the female being the main host, because we only really have Katie Nolan in terms of like yeah. a network supporting a Nolan. main yeah. comedy host, sports comedy host, where we have so many male late night hosts that we never, we don't even think twice about Conan and Jimmy Fallon and Jimmy Kimmel and all these, these different people, but we only see like Katie is the only person that can do this. It's like, no, that's, that's not that's not a good message for anyone to sort of be, you know, putting out there into the world. And it's like, that was almost the old school message of there can only be one woman at a network or one woman on the sideline or one woman doing any of this kind of stuff, which was sort of very old school when women were first starting in sports broadcasting. And so it's almost like when you look at sports, you look at comedy, those are two super male dominated industries. So that's, that was what I, I like that my boss, who's female, Pam Duckworth, was like, I really want to, you know, have a strong presence in that realm. And I was like, that's exactly what I want to do, too. And so I kind of had a moment where I was offered a job at one place. It was more of a traditional network. And then I was offered this job to do my own shows with Fubo. And my manager at the time, Carlin, who used to work with John Ferreter. John, yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, unfortunately, John passed away last summer, mm -hmm. but right before he passed away, he did this deal with Fubo and he said, you know, you, he's like, I started Arsenio Hall's show. I've worked with some of the biggest entertainers in the world. Like when you're offered your own show, you have to take it. 
He's oh, like, yeah. you cannot turn this down. And I remember, and he's like, you're going to have to work so hard at it because it's, it's only going to be as good as, as you put the effort into, which is true. And also you do need, you know, other people supporting you and stuff. But I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this because this job in this other realm, I've proven myself in in network television and I can do something like that. This is way more risky and a bit different, but those are the fun parts about life in this journey is being able to have that opportunity and take it. So did that. And it was great. I mean, it's very difficult to do your own thing, to do your own show. And there's a lot of times that you're like, am I cut out for this? Is this the right thing? Like it was way easier in a different vein to do. Hey, oh, I have a game. I know exactly what I need to do in this. Or, hey, I have news updates. I know exactly what I need to write and do on the prompter. Whereas your own show is like, you can do whatever you want. And you have so many different avenues and you're like, I haven't written as much comedy as I probably should have before having my own sports comedy show. And then, okay, you don't have as much of a budget because you're on a newer platform. So then you're booking your own guests. You're trying to be creative with limited resources, which is very, very difficult, but you get more freedom to do different stuff and to try stuff out. Whereas sometimes at a bigger network, it'd be like, yeah, that's not going to fly or that joke's not going to work because we have partners in that realm where we don't have to necessarily worry about that. So yeah, it's been, it's been fun. It's still like such an ongoing process, but I've definitely learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about working with other people and it's your own show, but you have to make sure that everyone is on board and dialed in and wants to work for you. So I'm always making sure that everyone knows like it might have my name on it, but it's literally every single one of ours because it wouldn't be on air without every single other person. So it's been a new project, but it's, it's been fun. It's been, uh, it makes you feel, it's very rewarding. And I think you going throughout your career, you're constantly trying to figure out yourself, just like all of us, you get a job and it might not necessarily be like, all right, Julie, you get to bring in all this comedy. You get to be really loose and fun. Sometimes we got to take these jobs when we first start and be a little bit more stand up, a little bit more serious than we might want to be, but at least gives us that opportunity. So can you talk about some of the jobs you've had in the past that have really led to you figuring out to this is who I want to be and this is who I'm going to be throughout the rest of my career. Yeah. I mean, I think it's all just like a bit of trial and error. You got to do if You're lucky enough to be able to get a job, do it as to the best ability that you can and figure out is like, what are the things then you end up liking about it or not liking about it. Uh, you got to, as all of you guys know, and everyone listening to this, like it's very difficult to make it in this industry. So you have to very much hustle work, yeah harder than you thought was possible move I've moved to three different countries like seven different cities around the world just trying to to make this dream happen and then just being able to get a foot in the door and kind of like always trying to prove people to people that you're more than what they see and especially coming from Canada I wasn't known in the states ever at all and so I did have like an uphill battle to climb in that regard and stereotypes about Canadians and American sports and all that different kind of stuff. And I mean, the, the biggest thing at first is like, you got to pay your dues and there's going to be people that I'm paying my dues right now on, you know, my own show. And I've worked for 11 years in the industry and sometimes it'll feel like it's day one, but that's also a good thing because it keeps you hustling and grinding and still like gearing towards what you want it to be. And sometimes that does change too. Like sometimes some days I wake up and say, Hey, you know what? I really miss being a part of the action on games and silent reporting. Like, you know, I would still do that again someday, but I know that that's not like the ultimate path that I want to get to and do that kind of thing. I don't want to be on the NFL sidelines of a Super Bowl, but like if someone offered it to me, obviously you, you would be like, that sounds great. <laughs> <in> that <chat. laughs> um, Thanks for tonight. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> yeah, I think like it, it's, an odd message and he's like oh you got to figure out what you want that's almost a luxury at a certain point like you have to do every single job under the sun and then get the respect from people and get the skills and get the background to then sort of like be able to get you know my my show knows if I say hey can you guys edit this or can you do this and it's like they know I've been a videographer they know I've been an editor it comes with the respect that then they know I'm not just like some host yelling at them to do something but by that same token too, we do all these different things and then you kind of get to pick and choose. And also no, like I don't, maybe I don't want to move to another city right now. Like you start to think about all the other things in your life and that I used to travel for like 20 days at a time, go home for one day, go back on the road for 25 days. Like, is that 
is that the dream for a year or two it was it was great but then that's not what you want to be doing when you're 55 years old you know so it kind of changes and that's okay for it to change we were literally just talking about that like what and you're a prime example of you know, having that luxury because so many times, like, especially the position that like, you know, me and John are in right now, we say yes to everything. And you were in that position too. Like you have to. And so a lot of times you're saying yes to something that you're like, I don't know if this is a fit for me. I don't know if I'm going to love this, but you have to go through it to then get to a point where you now had that huge opportunity to say yes to either working for a network or working for this other, you know, having your own show. Like that's the point that everyone wants to get to. So it's really cool for you to say that that now you have that luxury after you did go through all the hard work, um, you know, before that. So, so I think that's huge. Something else that you said, you were talking about living in different countries. So we're going to kind of take it back. Um, what I think is really cool is you made a really big career move, um, but also a physical move. When you got the job with the FS1, you went from Canada to LA. You hadn't lived in the States before, right? Nope, I hadn't. So like, what was, what was that experience like in like culture shock? Like what was the biggest thing you learned like right away about America? Like that had to be huge, especially like pretty early in your career too, right? Uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was like really the coolest thing to ever happen to me. And I look back on those days glowingly because it was, it was really out of like a movie in a way to kind of be in the prairies of Canada working late nights weekends really I mean you talk about grinding that was the biggest grind of my life but it was also when I look back on it wildly fulfilling because I got to do so much but then even at that time I'd been applying to jobs in like somewhat bigger of a market in Canada and I tried to get the national networks TSN and Sportsnet to give me like screen tests and all this kind of stuff and just nothing was really working and then I met John who Carlin and I referenced earlier, who um, was an agent for Octagon. And I had done a documentary on a hockey player, Ryan Murray, who was from our, like right down the street from our station when he went through the NHL draft and also Morgan Riley. And so I worked with their agents at Octagon and we worked so close together on this documentary. And when it aired, I remember they said, hey, we'd really like to introduce you to someone in the entertainment side of Octagon, whatever. I was like, oh, wow an agent like America this is kind of crazy and so I had met John and then but at the same time when I'd gone to the NHL draft I had one of those like media books that had it oddly enough it had every producer and like director's name for every broadcast of every NHL team so I Which just blitzed them all wild, like to think about that like if you actually go I think I have one back here if you go I don't even want to grab it I'm tied up <laughs> But how insane is that, that those people's emails and phone numbers are just right there? That's and like a any, pot of gold. Yeah. If any, yeah. Really a pot of gold. If anybody <laughs> talent saw that and, or just realized like how many people just had those and was like, yeah, I don't I know. So I, I just did it. I did it to like that. basically every team in the States and heard back from like a handful of them. Actually the Kings it was so funny. I ended up hearing back <laughs> from them, but just like all of them are like, thanks for your information. Like we're not really looking for anyone. Yeah. But then I ended up meeting them years later, which was mm -hmm. kind of funny, but um, yeah. So then got to the States, like it was, it was a dream, like came down, whatever, did all these interviews ahead of time and then got hired at FS1, which was, I still always felt like they made some kind of mistakes of like, there's no way, but they were looking for people that kind of, no one really knew that well, like different faces, I guess you could say. And I'm sure for, I was making like 30 grand Canadian. Uh, that's great to be coming from that. You'll take literally anything they offer you. So uh, not saying it was bad or whatnot, but yeah, it was really cool. I'd say probably the biggest list lessons I learned in that transition was that in Canada, everyone is pretty trusting, open, um, very friendly. And I didn't, I was, I was too trusting when I got to the States. I was very, this is who I am. This is my background. These are all these things. I remember John saying, you can't tell people all those things about yourself. Like they'll use them against you. It's like, but I'm coming from a small town in Canada. Like what could possibly they use against me? He's like, they'll use that against you at some point. And I was like, oh wow. Like I didn't even realize that. And I think that might be also more of like an LA Hollywood type of thing too, very but LA, that would be yeah. the biggest thing. But and then also learning like different words that I used to pronounce in Canadian that you guys pronounce differently in American. And so those were always funny on the news desk, like figuring out, oh, okay, you guys say 
process. Well, Canadians say process, process. and yeah, oh organization and yeah. organization. So yeah. just like different little things that then I think we did. Yeah, it was, I think it was, um, I did like an Albert Pujols uh, news break or something. And I oh said, God. oh, now we bring you back to regularly scheduled program already in progress. And my producer came out and he's like, great news pit. He's like, but whatever that word was you said at the end, I don't know what, <laughs> like, <laughs> progress. Like, oh yeah, those Canadian things. I started writing it into my prompter to make sure I sounded more American, just so people weren't like, hmm, who is that? But then again, they're like, we want you to still be yourself. People, we're not hiding that you're Canadian, but don't let it stick out so much, you know? Oh my goodness. Um, I have a question about maybe the fear of not just, you know, leaving a new country and, or leaving your country that you grew up in and starting in a new country, but like, how scary was it, if at all, to just be planted in this huge role at FS1? Because I think a lot of budding reporters and broadcasters, you get the fear of going live, like it's like the fun rush, but like <laughs> how, how scary might it have been to like, not only get the fun rush, but like a fun rush on the big stage and just all of a sudden like that just in your lap. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely like a way bigger platform than local news in Saskatchewan to USA. Uh, so there was, I was nervous at first, definitely with hosting Fox soccer daily. I'd never hosted a, never hosted a, a show like that before or hosted a live national show. So I do remember being very nervous ahead of those times, like holding the desk. I was nervous when we came on air. But then just, you know, like anything, it's the reps, it's getting comfortable. And I'd had a lot of reps essentially heading into being in, in that position, maybe even comparatively to people in my role. Like I had done a lot of different stuff, just not that kind of stuff, like not, 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 not hosting that kind of show. So I felt comfortable myself. And it's funny looking back now, like having done stand up and improv and things that are awkward and very 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 difficult those times back then looked so easy because of having to like put yourself on stage and try to make a room full of strangers laugh is like terrifying so everything else seems easier but yeah it was a lot to take on and and especially had in news breaks where you'd only have 30 seconds and like your copy would be written exactly to 30 seconds I'd always be nervous I wouldn't get it in all on time or that I'd stumble and then I'd be like lagging and so but I like I still get nervous ahead of stuff but not like not like crippling nerves more just the adrenaline nerves but I definitely get that with live tv so and I miss that because we don't do our shows live yeah. and I love that that's kind of like sports right yeah. so that I miss that how do you can... deal with screwing up a little bit sometimes because one of my favorite parts of comedians and cars getting coffee is some of the best oh, comedians in show. the entire world are saying like yeah I still bomb. Like everybody is going to my show, but sometimes jokes just don't hit. Sometimes things just don't work out. So how have you been able to deal with people necessarily not liking that kind of content that you provide in a stand-up show? And then once you go in studio, you're like, is this a total breeze or how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, I think like the way, I mean, I, I don't have as much experience as a lot, obviously those comedians, but when I was doing it pretty regularly, I would go to open mics like every night and test out a lot of different jokes in maybe I'd use uh, a different analogy for the joke or a different number, a different phrase and open mics suck already because it's just a room full of comics. So you no, almost like some comics like don't want to laugh at your yeah. open mic because they don't want to like give you that. But it was great to just go up there and be like, okay, I'm working out a couple of these things. So sometimes people will be like, all right, I'm working out a punchline for this. Thumbs up if you like this one or this one. And then pe sometimes people wouldn't even like help them out in that, but whatever. But I'd say when I would get to the point of having a show, I'm, I was, had rehearsed that thing 5,000 times. Like I was probably not so much of a comedian as more of a performer. Like I needed to work more on the comedy side versus like, I felt dialed in like as if I was going to broadcast a show and I knew didn't, you know, didn't need any help whatsoever. I knew exactly all the markers I was going to hit every single thing. And I think that that's, it, it's, that's too rigid in a way. And then I have to, I was like learning how to bring in more of my crowd, like crowd work and 
improvisation so that you're not just set in like because sometimes as you mentioned like sometimes jokes don't go over well you can kind of tell when you have a pretty good opener joke and if that lands that's sort of like how you get the momentum going but if the if a good joke I remember a comedian telling me like if okay so if no one laughs at a joke you're like oh it's kind of odd like that usually does well try another one that does usually well and if they don't laugh at that the room just could suck so if you know that like a joke always lands and it doesn't with them it's not always your fault but then you have to learn how to just roll with it in different ways and it's it's it, honestly though it's easier as a broadcaster because you're not used to anyone laughing or cheering or anything so it almost was really odd hearing that the first time. It was like, oh, I have to factor into this time because I would I would blast through my stand up routine sometimes. That was what I needed to work on, like let stuff marinate because if you start talking while they're still clapping, they're gonna miss the next joke, right? So it was like really just being comfortable with silence and being like comfortable just sitting and and waiting because you know we're broadcasting. We're like, oh, I don't want any. We don't want to lags. We don't ums, ahs, anything like that. You're just like a robot, but yeah. that's not what comedy is. So those were two different things to kind of learn. And I think that leads Donna. into another question we had for you too. You're talking about like the pacing and being patient and you've had to be patient in your career too. And all of us have, yep. we all have our idea of, I mm -hmm. want this to happen now, especially during quarantine. We're like, well, there's some people that have jobs, but how are they getting those jobs? We're like, how do I need to be patient? But how do I also need to work really hard and be persistent so how have you used patience in your stand-up routine to allow an audience to really react and connect and then use patience in your career as well yeah it's just about slowing down it's slowing down everything yeah, your brain might be working at one clip but other people's brains work at a different clip and so in the stand-up realm it is taking an extra second here or there because they have to listen and then take in the information and understand like okay, I'm hearing that, what does that mean? Whereas you already know what the punchline is. So sometimes you're like, hey, you already, hey, this is what it is, blah, blah. And it might be funny, but the way you tell it, like, let it, like, sometimes you'll see comics, like, draw stuff out a bit. And I remember watching Mulaney at, like, a New Yorker festival. And he's like, every single word in my stand-up has a reason to be there. And so that's why I write mine all out in, like, a Word document, and I would kind of edit it so much so so that every single word has a reason to be there and then I memorized it like word for word which is not what I would suggest anyone else do but that's what I would do in broadcasting and that's kind of like how I molded the two but then for patients like I think we all learn this like even when you do end up getting the dream job that you want like it's not always gonna stay that way or there's gonna be different things that change or different management comes in and out different executives and different ownership you know we're, we're right now we're seeing everything change in the world where a year ago people would tell me oh don't ever leave sideline reporting because there'll always be sports and there are no sports right now so oddly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oddly enough like leaving that realm i'm in a decent position right now but i think it's like people have this idea that, oh, when you make it somewhere, you're, oh, you got it. Like now you can relax. Like you can never relax because the career is a roller coaster and that can be good and bad. Like, I mean, we always think it was a negative, but like it can be a positive. And when I look back on my career and there's certain decisions I regret or things I wish I'd handled differently, I think if anything, it's been fun. Like it's taken me around the world. It's taken me in so many different circumstances. And when I think, when I look back on this at the end of the day, I'll be like, you know what? That was a hell of a ride. Whether or not you spent 25 years at ESPN or you ended up getting to host all these different huge things. Like you basically did the speed dating of the entire industry of working on the sideline, hosting on a national network, being on a streaming service, doing comedy on tv and like that's not how i planned it to go but you have to just like you have to just like be be okay with the change and when things don't work out and then also not being above anything like knowing your worth of course not saying yes to everything but even if you think you're above it like it, you're not like you can still say yes to a bunch of things and i know even during this time right now i tell people think about ways that you can offer what you have and what you've learned to different companies. Like, okay, so we're all well-versed in interviewing. We have the technology to be able to pull stuff off. We have contacts. What are those, what can you do to offer that to something that's maybe not a sports company or not a team? 
You could offer that to some, like you could offer to a travel company saying, hey, yeah. let's like interview people around the world about different, I'm just spitballing right now. I don't know. Some, some company that might need right. your skills and expertise, like thinking outside the box in that, in that realm. So um, those are the things I've learned, being patient. You can't force something to happen. You can't pull a flower to make it grow. You just have to like literally sit and work on it and sit in the silence and be okay when things aren't going your way. Because once I remember I had an intern when I was in Saskatchewan and he knew I was trying to get out of there. I was like applying everywhere. No one was responding to my emails or anything. I'm like, man, this is, this sucks. Like these places aren't even that much bigger than this. And he's like, just be okay with being here. I remember he's like, just be, find what it is that you like about the job that wherever it's here or it's somewhere else, you know, that that's why you're doing it. And then it'll all happen. And it's like, once you're just like, I want, I like this job because of this, not because I need it to be on this level or need it to be in this city. Cause you know, when those things happen, it doesn't make you happy. You're still going to be always searching for something else. And so once I was just like, you know what, I like this for this and just was leaned into it, then LA happens. Right. So it's, it's kind of funny how the world works. It's a good reminder. I feel like we all do that. Like that's how our brains work in the industry for sure. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, what's the next step? Where can we get next? It's like, hold on. People would kill to have the jobs we currently have. Like, why yeah. are we not appreciating it? And so it's like, slow down. Yeah. <laughs> it was obviously it. so good. To so like, much easier said than done. Yeah. Like <laughs> to have those goals and to keep like doing that kind of stuff, but not to make yourself crazy if it doesn't happen when you want it to happen. Right. So, and yeah, just a reminder, like even on days when I'm like, oh, I wish my show was making millions of dollars on NBC. It's like, but you still have the show that you want. So remember that, you know, and then someday maybe it will do that or maybe it won't, you never know, so. Okay, Abby, do you want to explain our game? Okay, ready? Yeah. Yes, okay, so since you have your show, Drinks with Banks, we think it's only fitting that we do some drinking fun as well, even though. Awesome. We might have some water and water bottles water. here, but we're gonna There's make it no coffee. <laughs> It's too early for that right now. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to play the very classic drink if you've ever. This is easy. So we're all playing. Um, and Julie, feel free to jump in if you have any questions as well. So we're all a part of this game here. Do we want to just go around in a circle and do it? Each do one? Sure. Yeah. You want to leave yeah, it I'll off? Like that. Okay. Yeah, I'll start. All right. Drink if you've ever forgotten your microphone or forgotten to turn on your microphone. Seems like pretty classic. Oh yeah. The in the people that are listening and can't see this, this is this is a reason to go watch on YouTube. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> this is YouTube exclusive. <laughs> YouTube oh my god! Exclusive content. I've definitely right. forgotten to turn it on, and I've like sprinted to go back and get it. It's just yeah. Like, you're like I'm missing something. Like yeah. Where what is do it? I need? <laughs> Drink if you've forgotten what you were going to say live. Like while you were live, you were just like, oh, I, where are we going with this? Where? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. That's where the improv comes in is yep. like, what's next, but what's the next thing I can say? I think I remember I had one once as an MLS sideline reporter for Fox and it was like telling a story. Oh gosh, I forgot about who it was, but I, in the middle of it, I just was like, well, I got, I was looking at him telling it and like, as I was telling it and I just got a little tongue tied and I was like, say any word that comes to your mind, <laughs> like just get out of the, it wasn't on camera luckily. Cause like when you're not on camera, it's, it's easier for the audience to sort of like not realize that you're, that you're lost in it. Stumbling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, just say any word, say any word in the world. <laughs> yep. oh, I, I did end up taking a um improv class and they taught us because I I want to take more of them John I know you were thinking about taking some too but they do the word web so I'm like word web word word web like where can I go with this word here in my head <laughs> I bet right. we've forgotten more times than we probably or people probably realize but we just don't stop talking it's just like we're still saying things yeah. even if <laughs> just gonna go yeah and people we just never that, know yeah. though like yeah. you just you just go and we'll tell our bosses or something like that that they're probably the only people that actually know what the script is yeah or someone's sort of understanding what we're yeah. gonna ask the athlete or something the audience doesn't know no and they're as like long wow, just make it incredible. look like you're not breaking out no one else will notice yeah drink if you've ever mispronounced someone's name in an interview I had, I had, a, I had a, okay. So I'm not drinking on this one. I almost 
mispronounced Gennady Golovkin, but I got it before because he, <laughs> the way he was telling me just was, it sounded so much better than I would have said. <laughs> it just, it was triple G is hard great. Thing. I'm not in an oh, interview, I but I definitely think in like highlights, maybe there's been like, oh, um, oh I guess I've was it uh, Nurma Gomedov? Yeah. Went the fighter. I remember that one. I had to write that one out. I probably didn't even say it right. Nurma Gomedov. Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think <laughs> like I now remember I'm trying one. to remember how to say it. Yeah. It's a tough one. I remember. Oh, what, we had what like was our it? Business, business intelligence, like VP at the Sharks. And oh, those are the worst. You can't th- even find their pronunciation. Oh, man, There's no guide we, for those people. Yeah, like we've done a good job with <laughs> athletes and coaches and stuff. I think her last name was like Taba Taba Tabate or so. It was like it was like <laughs> so repetitive, oh and I was like, I remember just fumbling over that one. And I think pe- it was intermission. People weren't paying attention anyway. <laughs> Most people aren't paying attention to anything. You you notice? <laughs> yeah, time, so. very forgiving. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Or, or the total right. opposite. Yes, do, do you have opinion. one? Um, never have I ever, or whatever. I haven't ever had uh, a drink before going on air. You get to drink for a show. Yeah, I uh, have. <laughs> I've seen wow. a few guys have. Oh, man. We did the Olympics nope. in 2014 in Sochi, and we, like, filmed everything on figure skating with oh, Michelle Kwan and Peter Schrager, and then we we went down to the hotel bar we had a ton of drinks and then they're like actually we need you guys to go back up and redo it because like there was a mistake in it and so we had to redo it after we'd had like five or six drinks or something and it was great yeah oh my gosh (laughs) what a story i know at the olympics why not i had we did a um we did a cocktail bit for we had like a special cocktail of the night at one of our homegrown games and so i did a full like show on like how they made the cocktail and then after I drank I drank the cocktail on the video and then I yeah. finished drinking after <laughs> and then I went and did the the show so nice little buzz right you know it was a Just part loosen, of it loosens you up it yeah part of the part of the job so that was a good one um okay drink if you've ever had something on your face or your shirt or your hair and you had no idea and you went on air uh-huh yeah, definitely. We talked about this with Molly last week, but <laughs> popping a zit and then going on air and not realizing <laughs> what the aftermath looked like. Oh, no. I definitely was, like, bleeding on my forehead interviewing no. Dustin Brown. <laughs> it just looks like a weird, like, brown <laughs> speck so from far away. He's but am used to it, though, seeing, you know, the blood. He's just like, oh, she just yeah. she get beat up before this or yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what was she doing before this? Because yeah. I have a reason, but what the heck? Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was bad. <sighs> yeah, it's producers are supposed to tell you, though, if you have something. That was one of those uh, recorded interviews where no one's paying attention yet because they're all in the truck. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever sworn on camera when you weren't supposed to? So, like, sure, maybe a podcast or um, a show where you're allowed to, fine. But have you ever, like, live TV said, you know, something maybe you weren't supposed to? In the bad language department. I definitely have not on network TV, but we're allowed to, we are allowed to swear on like FUBA. We just bleep it out. It's yeah. like our guest does or we do. Yeah. So that's the nice. That's different. I had a bummer. Yeah, How about you guys? Nothing. I, ha- I had a, an allowed swear uh, for FS1 Digital when I, when I joined the team and did my little like intro video and they did bleep it out, but that was like, that was it. it yeah. Was- it's kind of funny. It's like part yeah. of the bit, right? Yeah. We're edgy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like if it's bleeped out in a pre-recorded video, it's meant to be there. So. Exactly. Exactly. We we did an intermission bit when I was um on our broadcast and it was called bench warmers and I said it really fast and people thought I said bitch warmers. So I got on oh. Twitter and people were like, Did Abby just say bitch warmers? And I was oh, like, Oh man. Oh, no. No. It was like my it was like my second broadcast too. I was filling in for a ringside reporter and I was like, this is awkward. <laughs> Drink if you didn't know you were live. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one. I feel like there's so many times that that's happened where 
we did one once with FS1 where I was doing a game at the Rose Bowl, Manchester United and LA Galaxy. And we're doing a pregame hit, like with the, I, had, I was just with like an analyst and his microphone died. So I just like put mine in front of him. And then I was about to be like, all right, something like, okay, when, the, if this happens when we're on air, like what should we do? Or like when we're live? And luckily I didn't say that because that was the real hit, right? I was like, oh, that was <laughs> live. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely right, been, been on, but like not speaking. Like it, like they'll sometimes. Yeah, those away. are usually yeah. always the ones. Yeah. Yeah, like they'll cut away after an interview and then cut back, and I've definitely like not known that they had <laughs> cut back. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I've just been like either like, uh, I don't know, nothing crazy, but just like did not know, and then watched it back later or saw like the clip full clip on Twitter, and I'm like, oh yeah, there, yep, I'm back. They cut back. <laughs> Yeah. They got back. I'm still with this person. I did not know. <laughs> Hot microphone is always dangerous. <laughs> yeah. What about you guys? Anyone else? Um, I was Don dancing suggestively with Sharky one time for sure. And Chris Wondolowski <laughs> that like, <laughs> it's like when you're, when you're off camera, like before an interview or something and you know, they throw in some like Bay area hip hop, like you got to get after it. So that's that was, awesome. and it, I, we didn't like expect it at all. I think that's why we were just like doing that. So it's like a half twerk, like something that no one needs to see live or on a big video board. So like that, that was pretty funny. That was a couple of years ago with him. That's they, uh, I was, I was sidelining for ACC football and, um, I did, I did a hit. I wasn't on camera, but my mic was hot. And so I finished the hit and then my play-by-play uh, -play guy like said something else to me and I didn't hear him, but my microphone was hot. And I guess I was like laughing. And so like, all you hear is like him say something and then it comes back to me and it's just like, ha, 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 ha. and he goes, well, there, <laughs> like running away laughing. And I like, went and watched That's the game. That's awesome. So oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of times when yeah your microphone's just on and you don't realize that yeah. when you're trying to talk I think to that producer. might be that might be the the harder part than being on camera being live is like okay when's my mic on and when is it on <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I'm just so happy to get to like chat with you during this time Julie and just like I know catch up hear some more of your story I mean I'm so proud of you and everything that you're doing over in New York and it's just it's been such Aww, a, you're so sweet. It's just such a joy to like see your career grow. And I don't know. I, I, I love that. Like, it's just like, oh, thanks. I know how funny you are and I'm just glad like the world gets to see how funny you are now and, and just watch you do your thing. No, I think it's more just like quirky weird. I'm not sure about the funny. It's, I'm fun. <laughs> I wouldn't say funny, but it is, uh, yeah, it's been fun, but I definitely miss being there in the, in the South Bay and in LA. So especially during this time when way nicer to be outside versus like in a studio apartment in Manhattan but hey you know we're all doing our part so if you're not going to call yourself funny cocktails. we'll call you funny so we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll do well, that for you. you we'll promote Appreciate the funniness that. but it's it was great meeting you and chatting about yeah, some of this good stuff chatting, there, guys. Needs to, there needs to be more comedy and more looseness in sports because sometimes we take it too serious so I think you really add to that conversation and keep things fun keep it light and you are funny just just thanks well i think it's like a good uh avenue that like a lot of people are starting to sort of flex their muscles in and be like it's okay to make jokes about sports and to not always be like oh x plus y equals z it's like we can have a little bit of fun with it it's entertainment so hopefully people keep on doing that during the time because i think like we're seeing great stuff on twitter and tiktok and instagram so you know and this you guys are creating your own thing here so that's great so I think the thing that was so awesome is she really made some good points as far as advice and skill set, some things that she said specifically how she memorized her own scripts. You know, that's that's something that you don't often hear. So it's kind of cool to get her view um, and the things that she does to help better herself, create content and how obviously it's worked for her as well. So that was really cool to hear. And the content fatigue just during this time in general, you know, while we're all sidelined we're doing this podcast to fill some time and to bring some content to everyone listening, but how it's okay to just slow down and be like, wow, okay. You know, 
other people are worried about their jobs as well. You don't have to push everything out into the social media world and make sure you're at the forefront of everything. It's okay to just slow down and chill out and not, to, not put so much on your own plate too. So for, for us that are kind of creating during this time, it was kind of nice to hear someone at her level be like, yeah, just chill out. It's okay to just chill out for a second. And then we all feel like there's this industry standard. So you start here and then you go here and then you got to be like this. And then if you're a male, you're probably going to fit in this way. You're a female, you're going to fit in this way. Like there's so many people that we've talked to already. And it's like, well, I'm going to be a trailblazer. I'm going to use bits and pieces of that, but I'm going to figure out what I need to do and who I should be while being uniquely myself. Trying to be somebody else, that job's already taken. So it's great talking to someone like Julie, who's like, I like comedy. I like stand up. I like improv. I like sports, but I'm going to try to figure out a way to incorporate both those things without trying to be somebody I'm not. And that's super inspirational. And it's, especially for me, I think there's been times in the industry where I'm like, I don't really feel like I fit in here or fit in there. And then maybe that just means you got to start your own stuff and figure out people that are going to give you those opportunities because those opportunities aren't just going to be on some job board some way. You got to figure out how to make those right connections and do what you were meant to do. For sure. It's how do you stand out? That's always the biggest thing. How do you make, how can you continue to be yourself, but also, you know, be different than everyone else. So I think that's huge. And that was awesome to hear from her on that. Um, speaking of standing out though, I, everyone has podcasts these days. So we want you guys to continue supporting us and listening to us. Uh, so we can stand out by, I guess, uh, social media, John, I don't know. Tell us how they can do that. I'm glad you said stand out because that is a huge song in a goofy movie. And I'm rocking this t-shirt right now. <laughs> if anybody can't see that. How did we just notice that? Let's go. I just noticed that shirt. One of the best Disney movies of all time, but let's talk about how you can follow us at Sideline Pod. That's on Instagram and Twitter. We're also on YouTube as well, Sideline Pod. So we're going to post the video version of all these episodes that you guys can check out. But make sure you review, follow, subscribe, and please tell me in the comments, wherever it may be, that a goofy movie is a top five Disney movie. Thank you. It is. It is. <laughs>